Hello, and welcome to our webinar series, Next Steps in COVID-19 Response and Long-Term Care. I'm Andrea Pichet, Senior Program Lead at Healthcare Excellence Canada, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm pleased to be your host today. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples since the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge that we are broadcasting this webinar from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place and the opportunity to gather here today. We are pleased to offer French simultaneous interpretation for this session. If you wish to hear the voice of the interpreter, please select French from the interpretation menu at the bottom of your screen. We invite you to share your questions and comments at any point using our chat box in either English or French, and we encourage you to respond to each other's comments and answer questions in the chat as well. We will aim to connect as many of your questions as we can with our speakers during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you need support at any time during this webinar, you can reach out to tech support using the chat feature. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website in the next couple of days to review or share with colleagues who missed it. We recognize that today marks Canada's day of mourning to honor Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We will end our session promptly at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to support those who are planning to observe a moment of silence at that time. Finally, we are excited to share that the next phase of Healthcare Excellent Canada's programming to support long-term care is launching soon. Stay tuned for more information about an opportunity to receive support to build better care with and for people living and working in long-term care. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Sharon Kasselainen joining us to talk about improving capacity within long-term care to implement a palliative approach to care. Dr. Kasselainen is a professor and holds the inaugural Gladys Sharp Chair in Nursing at McMaster University. She's an associate member of the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster and an honorary adjunct professor in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Technology, Sydney. She is co-lead of the Strengthening a Palliative Approach in Long-Term Care, or SPA-LTC, program, which aims to improve the quality of living and dying for residents and their family and friends in long-term care. Sharon, I'm pleased to turn it over to you. Hi there. Hi, Sharon. Welcome oh back. Oh my God. Oh, no, not to worry. <laughs> this is uh, th these are all things out of our control. Like most of what we experience in the healthcare context, right? We're just making it work the best we can with whatever comes our way today. So I appreciate your persistence and uh, your patience and in. in you know, working through the technical glitches. So I've already done an introduction. I'm very excited. You have a very um, generous and uh, curious and excited audience that's ready to hear from you. So I won't take any more time. I'm going to turn it right over to you. Great. Well, first off, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around. Uh, and Andrea, for your uh, absolute fabulous job uh, entertaining everyone and keeping them linked in uh, while I was off. And I'm really hoping that will be the worst of it. I'm just so excited uh, to be able to meet you all and talk to you about some of the work that uh, my team and I have been doing. So given we're uh, 10 minutes in, I'm going to try to kind of move things uh, through a little bit faster. Uh, but as Elizabeth nicely posted on the chat, uh, please visit our website. Uh, we're uh, constantly adding new resources uh, and developing uh, some of our program components. So, so please do that. Uh, so if you could move to the next slide, please. Great. So, so today, uh, you know, I, I'm going to speak a little bit about why a palliative approach to care is needed in long-term care. Uh, a little bit of uh, work around uh, some of the review we've done around different models uh, that have been published and, and tried uh, in long-term care, and then move into speaking about our, our SPA LTC program that uh, we've been working on uh, for probably, I think we're close to eight or nine years now. We've been uh, developing this program and working with residents and families and staff to help us do that. 
some of the evaluations, so some of it is published, uh, some not published yet, but I'll share some of the results of, of the evaluation of our tools uh, and how you can access our resources. Next slide, please. So as, as many of you know, uh, the current stay in long-term care is very short. Uh, less than 18 months uh, in Ontario and I, uh, here in BC and, and other provinces, it's, uh, it's moving towards less than 12 months. So, so this population really is uh, what we would consider a palliative population with you know, less than a year to live. Many of them uh, dying well before the year uh, because we're seeing people enter long-term care, they're much frailer. Uh, their health care needs are more complex um, and create lots of challenges for trying to uh, create a, a peaceful death and support families along the way. Uh, particularly uh, when residents uh, in long-term care, we're seeing up to 70% that have dementia and other mental illness, uh, which makes decision-making uh, and supporting families and residents in the care trajectory very challenging. Uh, and what we don't want to see is family members uh, at uh, end of life having to make decisions uh, on behalf of their loved ones in crisis mode, stressed, uh, and some of these negative effects uh, lasting well into bereavement. Next slide, please. So th this was an a editorial I, I, I wrote actually before COVID, uh, but it was... Uh, based largely on some work that had been done with colleagues in, in Europe. Uh, many of you may know about the PACE program, uh, very similar to our SPA LTC program and, and some of the other programs uh, in Canada. Uh, but essentially what we're seeing is there's a desperate need for training and education in long-term care uh, for staff around how to implement a palliative approach. And when we do provide uh, training, uh, we're seeing limited reach. So with 80% of staff being PSWs or, or healthcare aides, uh, providing most of the hands-on care, uh, but unfortunately they're not the ones that are often uh, attending education, uh, but as we uh, know could benefit from it the most. Uh, the other piece is, is really trying to build capacity by developing internal champions uh, so this can be in the form of a, a palliative champion team. Uh, and then also leveraging, uh, we're fortunate in, in many provinces to have palliative consultants or uh, outreach nurse practitioners uh, to help support long-term care homes. So we call that external facilitation. And then from a, a kind of a quality improvement or research standpoint, are we using the right outcomes? So are we really tapping into what families, residents, uh, what we all believe uh, would be a successful uh, outcome for any kind of intervention. Next slide, please. So we uh, embarked uh, on a scoping review a few years ago, uh, many of us involved, uh, and essentially we, we found that there were four primary uh, care, uh, palliative models that have existed in long-term care over the years. Uh, in, the, in the earlier stages, uh, end-of-life care, uh, and this was, I remember this happening when I was an RN in long-term care, anyone uh, who was approaching end-of-life or at end-of-life, we often would try to get a palliative uh, physician, uh, palliative nurse in to help uh, support the residents and families. So bringing someone in from outside the home. Uh, we quickly realized there's not enough of those uh, external specialists uh, to meet the needs of long-term care, uh, we needed to develop that expertise within long-term care uh, and really the focus still being at end of life. Uh, so somewhere along the line, we, we realized, and thankfully we realized, we needed to actually start earlier. So we needed to start talking about uh, wishes and values and how to pre uh, prepare families uh, for those decisions at end of life when they're not so stressed. Uh, so that's when we uh, brought in the, the philosophy of a palliative approach. And I would say this has been maybe 15 years. Uh, the time is flying by. Uh, I, I, I've kind of looked to my colleagues in Australia who, who were probably about eight years ahead of us on this. 
but I think that's when we started wanting to uh, focus more on building capacity to implement a palliative approach and that being uh, advanced care planning as well. So being able to get people, you know, as soon as we can, uh, talking about some of their values and wishes uh, and things that are important to them that they anticipate for end of life. And then finally, we've landed on this need to have uh, inter internal uh, capacity uh, within a palliative approach, uh, but also leveraging expertise from uh, the palliative specialists, being uh, the physicians, as I mentioned, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, palliative consultants, anybody uh, that has the expertise that can help support long-term care homes. Next slide, please. And that's essentially how we've uh, developed our SPA LTC program, strengthening a palliative approach in long-term care. Uh, and we're trying to uh, initiate some of these discussions, sharing information uh, early on, uh, soon after admission, and hopefully someday even before admission, uh, where we won't be needing to just start advanced care planning. Uh, hopefully it will be starting long before people uh, come to long-term care. But you can see here we have a bit of a staged approach. Uh, we have some core pillars, we call them. Uh, so preparing for future changes, improving comfort and quality of life, and that including uh, pain and symptom management, and then building caring relationships as well. We've seen that uh, more and more in our work and the need uh, to have those caring relationships within residents and staff, residents and families, families and staff, and, and staff and staff. We all need to be having a, a more supportive uh, sense of relationships to really implement a palliative approach successfully. And then at the bottom of the model, you'll see uh, we have uh, a, a series of, of uh, interventions really dedicated to building uh, organizational capacity. So these are really developed more towards uh, staff, uh, and the organization as a whole uh, to implement a palliative approach. And I'll talk about some of the tools we have uh, later on. Next slide, please. So our, our research strategy uh, really uh, has been based on participatory action research, or PAR, uh, which is very similar to a quality improvement uh, process where we collect data, reflect on it, try to make changes, develop tools, uh, and we've been doing this for a number of years, uh, stemming way back to when I worked with Mary Lou Kelly on the Palliative Alliance uh, back in the, er, the early 2000s. Next slide, please. Here is a, a kind of a different way of looking at our model. So this is how we've organized our tools and resources kind of conceptually uh, among these, these, these core components or pillars that I mentioned before. I think we'll move to the next slide as well. This, this all can be found on our website if you're interested or feel free to email me. I'm just cognizant of the time I've wasted and, and I don't want to waste any more. So next slide, we have uh, a, a few tools for staff that we've developed and that's kind of how I've organized them here for my presentation. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, this was uh, findings from one of our uh, recent studies where we held an educational workshop uh, for staff on communication training in particular. We had Jane Webley, who many of you may know of uh, from BC, come to uh, Hamilton and Toronto uh, and, and, and implement our palliative communication training for one of our studies. But the key thing here I wanted to, to highlight, uh, not only was it effective in, in uh, staff feeling more comfortable to engage in end-of-life discussions, uh, in advanced care planning, but you can see here the, the PSWs or healthcare aid and the support staff had the lowest levels before the workshop of comfort, uh, but after the workshop, they increased the most. So essentially what I'm saying in this slide, we really need to support uh, our unregulated or frontline staff being PSWs, healthcare uh, aides, and support staff, rec therapists, dietary, they're the ones uh, who don't often get it, uh, invited to educational training, but desperately need it and improve the most. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've uh, developed a series of eight e-learning modules um, 
this was for one of our studies uh, that was funded actually through uh, Health Excellence Canada recently. We've piloted them, uh, we're developing some frequently asked questions and we're using them for another study, uh, but we're also opening them up for anyone else who'd like to access them. They're uh, free of charge. Uh, you essentially just need to click on them. You do need to register, so putting in your name and email address, uh, but we'd like to give you uh, a certificate at the end, and that's one way we can do that. So uh, they're uh, uh, developed uh, largely on a palliative approach and aligns up with our SPA model. Uh, Elizabeth Antifo is the, are the, is the brains behind them. I'll give her full credit. She did an excellent job. Uh, and is another BC uh, clinical nurse specialist who helped us develop them. Uh, they're free, they're open access, highly recommend using them if, if you feel they would be helpful. Next slide, please. Uh, and the nice thing with the modules uh, is that they're not intended uh, for support staff uh, only. We actually developed them more for support staff, uh, personal support workers, healthcare aides, uh, and really, what are the core nuggets of a palliative approach? And uh, we tried to keep them short. They're all under 15 minutes, so hopefully staff can uh, do them when they have time in their in their day. Uh, but yeah, hope uh, would love to get feedback if any of you do try them out. Uh, we're always looking at uh, improving our resources. So the other resource that we've uh, used and, and found quite successful. Uh, in building internal capacity uh, is, is using comfort care rounds. And I will uh, be very honest that this is not one of our, our, our brainy uh, activities. Uh, it came from the palliative consultants here in Ontario who have been implementing them for quite a while. Uh, Mickey Turner, uh, when, before she was retired, she worked closely with me on one of my studies and, uh, and led the comfort care rounds at the home. Uh, we were working with uh, and uh, with wonderful results. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's really dependent on the home, how often they want uh, to use them, the topics that are discovered or, or discussed. Uh, and some homes actually uh, have uh, morphed it into a bit of a, a huddle around the nursing station. So rather than pulling people off the floor, they just uh, gather uh, staff uh, while they're available and just meet at the nursing station and have some debriefing. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity to reflect on previous resident deaths uh, and to get staff talking about what went well, what didn't go well, uh, also around current issues uh, among staff and residents dying or, you know, is there a particular resident who's struggling with pain management? Uh, and having an external consultant or a very well-trained internal consultant we've used as well uh, to help uh, kind of facilitate and mentor staff uh, working through some of these issues. Uh, so this is a publication uh, if anyone's interested. And next slide, uh, I'll be able to talk to you about uh, some new resources. Uh, Dr. Abigail Wixon Griffiths from the University of Regina helped uh, develop these, and these are really for for training for uh, for staff uh, based on common uh, topics that we that we've seen discussed in comfort care rounds. So it's a way to to use for for staff training uh, to kind of be a bit more preemptive, uh, and they're very detailed. You'll see here, uh, and and offers uh, uh, staff uh, you know a way to to kind of go through different questions that you can ask other staff. Uh, so it's a bit of a training uh, module for a holding comfort care rounds. Next slide, please. Uh, the other the other piece uh, that we've developed, uh, we've we found a, a wonderful IT person who's helped us develop these e-learning modules. Uh, so we've we've developed these. Uh, we call them uh, polish your practice or polish. Polishing practice for PSWs and health support workers, again, trying to target uh, personal support workers, healthcare aides, support staff. And these were three common uh, issues that uh, we noticed were coming out of chart audits that we were doing for one of our studies. Uh, Dr. Tamara Sussman at McGill largely led this, uh, and we developed these case scenarios based on these topic areas. Uh, and again, it's, it's an e-learning module, so you can walk your way through it. There's some reflection questions. 
uh, but really trying to build capacity within staff, uh, you know, how to communicate effectively with residents and families and, and how to manage their own questions uh, and, and comfort level in these kinds of situations. So, so those, I don't know if they're on our website yet. They may be, but they will be coming shortly. Uh, another great way to build capacity uh, among staff. And even though I, I emphasize personal support workers and healthcare and support staff, uh, to be honest, I think nurses uh, can benefit just as much from some of these uh, resources. And uh, I'm trying to get them into our undergrad program as well for nursing uh, because uh, something is better than nothing uh, that's happening right now. Next slide, please. So we have some uh, wonderful videos, uh, literally hot off the press in the last couple of months. Uh, one that uh, really has been focused on family-centered care. Uh, it, it was uh, initiated during COVID and our Saskatchewan uh, colleagues, so Dr. Paulette Hunter, Dr. Abigail Wixon Griffiths, uh, uh, have this wonderful network of family advisors and uh, palliative uh, experts working together, and they developed quite a few different videos. Uh, trying, their focus really is on trying to uh, uh, nurture family-centered care. So this is one video here. Uh, we have a few on our website. Uh, the second video, Dr. Sandy Shaman, many of you may know for in Ontario in particular. Uh, she has a leadership role in the Ontario Long-Term Care Clinicians uh, Group uh, as a medical director, a palliative uh, physician, a wonderful combination uh, for long-term care homes. Uh, so we have a video with her speaking about what a palliative approach is from her perspective. Uh, we have a nurse as well speaking and a PSW in this video, uh, just trying, uh, trying to kind of get everyone on the same page around what a palliative approach is. Uh, and it's a wonderful video to learn about that. And then finally, uh, Dr. Shane Sinclair at the University of Calgary. Many of you probably know him. He's just a fabulous speaker uh, and has done a lot of work around compassionate care. Uh, and Margaret Keating, who's a family adv advisor uh, on, on uh, our studies. Uh, both of them are profiled in this video and, and it's, it's really just a fantastic video. One of the things we have found uh, in many of our projects, uh, we often don't give the focus we need to on spiritual care, supporting residents and families uh, within a spiritual uh, uh, perspective. So this is something we're trying to work towards, uh, and this was one of our first tools was to develop the vid a video. Uh, and, you know, as Shane would say, spiritual care doesn't always have to involve, uh, you know, a reverend, a pastor, uh, you know, a rabbi. There's many things we can be doing in our day-to-day -day practice to support spiritual care in long-term care homes. Next slide, please. We have, uh, this is kind of cool, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who like podcasts and maybe have a big commute on your way to work, uh, we have a series of podcasts that we've developed and we're continuing to develop, uh, looking at uh, different roles in long-term care. We have uh, Amit Area, who's a, a palliative specialist. Uh, Sandy Shaman, again, is on a podcast. Uh, we have a PSW. We have Mary Lou Kelly. Uh, we have a nurse, uh, we have family advisors, uh, palliative consultants. We have an excellent one from palliative consultants that's actually getting quite a bit of uptake. We can see how many are, are listened to, and that's one of our popular ones. We're constantly uh, adding new ones. We have one from a rec therapist as well around uh, what a palliative approach uh, in terms of a rec therapist means and how they can help support it in their practice. Next slide, please. Okay, and we'll just move to the next slide. Uh, we've, we've, uh, I've talked a little bit about some of the work we've done to support staff or building uh, capacity uh, among staff in the organization. Now, we've also have tools that we've developed to support residents and families uh, in meeting their needs. And uh, this is one of the uh, one of our very first resources we never planned to make, uh, uh, Dr. Sussman and I, uh, in one of our studies. But we quickly realized uh, that families were needing more information about what to expect 
uh, within a palliative approach uh, and to give them some information early on. Staff were telling us this was important, but they didn't always say that they were that comfortable with having these discussions. So we decided uh, to develop uh, these pamphlets. So we have five of them on different common conditions in long-term care. So you can see here, uh, they are downloadable. We have uh, a, a kind of a two-page template and, uh, that we developed for our, our Health Excellence Canada uh, project again, uh, so that they're a little bit easier to print. These are tricky to print. Uh, and we've gotten some feedback from families about accessing them online. The main thing is we get the information out to families and, and residents. Uh, we have different modes uh, to do that. Next slide, please. So what we've done in some of our homes uh, is just have these on display uh, for residents and families to pick up when they feel comfortable or when they need the information. Uh, it's kind of funny. We see staff use picking them up as well and reading them, and uh, they're, they've been vetted uh, by a number of people, a number of specialists, uh, we have them available in, in French as well, and we've adapted them for, I think, six or seven different provinces now. So part of the pamphlets have a, a resource, a list of resources for families uh, to access with links. So we have customized those in terms of uh, what's available in each province. Next slide, please. Uh, we've had uh, two publications that have evaluated the pamphlets. Uh, essentially, you know, all positive, uh, positive feedback from families. Uh, but the one uh, piece that we did struggle with, uh, they, you know, they, they found it would help them reflect what questions to ask, but they didn't actually start engaging in conversations with uh, their loved ones in long-term care. So it was a very passive uh, 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 kind of way to, to learn information, which was great and much needed. Uh, but we also felt it's important for families to start talking with residents and staff uh, to get these conversations going. So next slide, please. We, we embarked on another study uh, using the conversation starter kits. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Um, we'll talk about the conversation starter kit, I think, next. Uh, but uh, we've also, I, we, I should also put a plug in for these new resources. Uh, they're conversation guides. So what we developed, uh, and we realized that staff needed to be able to answer questions as, fam as families raised them. So we were giving families these pamphlets to read, uh, but then uh, when they would ask questions to staff, staff weren't feeling comfortable or ha were able to give them the, the answers that they wanted. So we've developed these conversation guides uh, really as a staff building exercise. Uh, so staff could feel more comfortable answering questions uh, that likely would emerge from families reading the pamphlets. Okay, next slide, please. Now we can move on to the conversation starter kit. Uh, this was uh, developed uh, in the U.S. Many of you may know about uh, this initiative. Um, it essentially, what Tamara and I liked about it was it was geared for people who had dementia. So the orange version uh, was the booklet that, fam or that residents could use. The purple booklet was for families uh, to use uh, to support them in having these conversations uh, with residents. Or when uh, residents are no, no, not, no longer able to engage in these conversations, a way for families uh, to be able to reflect and uh, uh, spend some time thinking about uh, decisions that they would have to make later on in the trajectory as the resident uh, nears end of life. So next slide, please. So essentially, it's a very simple booklet to use. Uh, we did modify it uh, for Canada. Uh, it is has been translated to French as well. Uh, I'm not sure we have that version on our website, but uh, I'm sure Dr. Sussman uh, has it handy in her files. Uh, but essentially getting priming people ready to actually have the conversation. So there's a get ready, get set. We'll go to the next slide, please. And then there's go. So, you know, probing families and residents about the kinds of questions they need to think about uh, and, and some of the, uh, you know, getting them talking about what's important to them 
uh, you know, level of engagement that they, you know, how, how engaged do they want to be in, in some of these important decisions, uh, you know, talking about end of life uh, decisions that are uh, most likely going to happen, but preparing them uh, for those decisions and starting to get those conversations going now. Next slide, please. So what we found uh, was that residents who used the booklet, and we actually had 44 residents completed, which we were pretty excited about. We had, we had three homes involved in this study, uh, and we were fortunate to get 44 residents engaged. Uh, but we found residents, after having read the booklet, uh, they were asking more questions to their health care provider. So that was great to hear. So they were getting more engaged, asking questions, uh, which is exactly what we wanted them to do. Next slide, please. And for families, uh, we were a bit surprised initially. Uh, we used uh, the self-efficacy and decision-making at end-of-life tool, and we found that families uh, were actually feeling pretty certain at the baseline, so before they had the booklet, uh, about de decisions they would have to make on behalf of the resident later on. Uh, but after completing the booklet, uh, they felt less confident. Uh, so this was not what we expected, but actually, uh, when you think about it, it makes sense because families were starting to learn about the kinds of questions and decisions they would have to make at end of life. So the booklet served as a way to kind of trigger uh, them uh, and create awareness about what they were going to need to be prepared with uh, later on. So we actually ended up feeling pretty good about that finding uh, and hopefully families, you know, pursued uh, and were getting and did get the information that they needed uh, to feel more confident uh, later on. Next slide, please. So Conversation Starter Kit really, you know, is an advanced care planning initiative for residents when they're uh, able to engage uh, in, in uh, these discussions with families and staff. Uh, but as we know in long-term care, there's a small window of time when that can happen. Uh, but largely, we're looking at end-of-life uh, decision-making, uh, goals of care, treatment decisions, which we have uh, really tried to focus in on uh, with palliative care conferences. So this is something we've uh, learned from our Australian colleagues who have uh, included this in, in their toolkit as well. Uh, but getting families together with staff uh, and the resident, if the resident is able, uh, together in a meeting so that they can ask questions, uh, you know, get, get their questions answered, receive information, and to get some support from staff uh, so that uh, they can make informed decisions about, uh, you know, what what will happen uh, at end of life for the resident. Uh, we use a palliative performance scale to trigger these confer uh, conferences. So uh, these aren't regular annual care conferences. These are special ones for someone, uh, a resident who is nearing end of life. So a PPS score, we started off with 30%. For those of you who know the PPS, uh, we realized that's not soon enough. We bumped it back to 40%. And uh, now our current study, we actually have it at 50%, trying to capture residents and families uh, well in advance before, uh, before a resident dies. But you can see, uh, you know, uh, the focus of these uh, conferences are around giving uh, information. Uh, and we really want families uh, to be front and center and making sure that their needs are met. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, this was our pi first pilot study on our SPA program, uh, and we, I would say, largely can attribute these findings to the Palliative Care Conference. Uh, so we found uh, residents who had a Palliative Care Conference had an 82%, uh, or 82% of our participating residents had a Palliative Care Conference, and for those of you, for those of them who had a Palliative Care conference, we saw a reduction of ER visits uh, of 55% in the last year of life, which was pretty good. Uh, and also, we found 72% uh, decrease in resident deaths in the hospital. So, trying to keep residents in the long term care home uh, 
and die there with families and staff who know them well. So we believe having palliative care conferences help prepare families and staff ahead of time uh, and appease families' uh, worries and anxieties that, you know, there are things we can do in long-term care to support a peaceful death for residents. So, uh, so we're pretty excited about, about those findings. Uh, certainly, it's nice to keep residents out of the hospital uh, if possible. There's always going to be some, you know, we estimate around 12%, I think, is is what we say, uh, we'll never get it to zero, and we don't want to get it to zero because some families want uh, and prefer to have residents go to the hospital. Uh, next slide, please. Just watching the time here, we've got, looks like 15 minutes left. Uh, so this is another resource, uh, the Comfort Care at End of Life booklet for persons with Alzheimer's. Uh, some of you may find it familiar. Uh, it was a booklet. Uh, the original booklet was developed by Dr. Marcel Arcan at uh, Laval, who is a palliative physician and a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, he's since retired, uh, but he's worked with us on this booklet, and we've adapted it recently for another study. We're working with five other countries who are uh, using the same booklet have translated it in, I think, 10, I think it's translated in about 10 different languages. Uh, but really, it's intended uh, for families. Uh, there's lots of questions for families of, of people who have dementia about, uh, you know, what to expect. Um, you know, uh, what should they be eating? How do you manage uh, pain? Uh, lots, of, lots of very important questions, common questions that families ask for people uh, who have dementia. Uh, we also have a, a question prompt sheet. Uh, Jenny Vandersteen from the uh, Netherlands, some of you may know her name. She does a lot of work in this area as well. So questions that kind of line up with the booklet uh, that uh, families may still want more information on. So what we found is having these questions uh, explicit, it almost gives families permission uh, to ask these questions or reminds them, yeah, yeah, that's something I'd like to know more about. So these two, uh, we're just winding up this study, uh, but the booklet itself is, is just phenomenal. Uh, Marcel really, uh, we just adapted it uh, slightly, uh, but just fabulous work. Uh, we do have it online for those of you who, who would like to use it. Marcel actually has a training video. We, video, we videotaped him uh, uh, so that you can, you can see him as well speaking to the booklet. Uh, it is in French. Actually, it was developed initially in French, so it's in both languages. Next slide, please. We can just move to the next slide. Uh, essentially, you know, we've learned a lot from COVID. Certainly, long-term care will never be the same. Uh, you know, I think we've finally <laughs> gotten uh, uh, out there and, and people are seeing uh, some of the, the, the challenges that long-term care homes have generally, uh, and more so with implementing a palliative approach. Uh, we partnered with Health uh, or C Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association during COVID, did a bit of a scan. We might have actually reached out to some of you on, 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 on the line here uh, and have a bit of a repository of tools. Uh, it was primarily, you know, kind of uh, meant to be for during COVID, but certainly uh, they're, they're quite uh, relevant still now. So there's the link for those of you interested to, to check that out. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other piece, uh, you know, I think we certainly realized how much we need to support long-term care staff. Uh, what they've had to go through during COVID uh, is really unbelievable. And now, you know, working with some homes, seeing uh, the shortages and the burnout and staff hanging in there, uh, but really we, we, you know, we need to support them more uh, given the, the amount of death that they see and sometimes not, not the nicest deaths that they've had to go through. So, uh, you know, how can we help support staff more to implement a palliative approach and manage their own grief and, and bereavement as well? Next slide, please. So many of you may have heard about reflective debriefing. Uh, we do build it into the comfort care rounds uh, as well, uh, but you can also hold separate reflective debriefing sessions. 
Uh, and this, uh, you can watch a video. Uh, this is Jo Hockley from uh, Scotland. She was uh, in, uh, really a leader in implementing the gold standards framework in long-term care. Uh, so this is a video of a, a real-life reflective debriefing session. Uh, and we've worked with the PACE group uh, to adapt it as a, as a teaching video. So we've got it down to about 12 minutes. Uh, for, for staff uh, or facilitators who want to learn more about reflective debriefing. So wonderful video. Uh, and then we also have kind of a two-page uh, cheat sheet for staff uh, who want to hold reflective debriefing sessions uh, themselves in their own home. And we hope that that will happen, uh, getting, you know, working your, your way through how, uh, you know, to describe the event, how did you feel, uh, and hopefully come up with some new learning uh, and, and, and staff feeling uh, better about uh, some of these experiences. We certainly don't want staff carrying, you know, their grief home with them uh, and for weeks on end, uh, and that's what we've been seeing a lot of lately. Next slide, please. So one of the focus, uh, uh, I think it's pretty clear, and certainly COVID has highlighted uh, we need to focus more on a psychosocial model of care, so bringing in the spiritual element, uh, bringing in uh, more effective communication, more social support uh, among all parties in long-term care, uh, particularly families. Uh, we certainly uh, you know, are hearing more and more from them uh, about how we need to support them better uh, within a palliative approach. Next slide, please. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Uh, uh, the, uh, one of my big dreams is to have long-term care, uh, a compassionate community where uh, we can break down the walls of long-term care homes and engage them more in the community. Uh, and uh, Alan Kelleher here, I was actually listening to him speak uh, a number of years ago, uh, and uh, I think there's lots of work we can do to, to uh, bring long-term care uh, uh, really look at it more as a hospice uh, and how can we link schools, uh, art museums, uh, more within the community and not an isolated sector uh, as it stands today. Next slide, please. Final thoughts. Uh, we need to build capacity in long-term care uh, across the board. Uh, I've shared with you some tools and resources to do that. Uh, that's the easy part. The hard part is getting them in practice uh, and getting time for staff uh, to be able to implement uh, and learn and, and engage in some of these resources. Need to focus on, on a family-centered model within a psychosocial uh, model of care uh, and really try to integrate long-term care homes uh, more into the community. Next slide, please. I think we're winding up here. Uh, I just want to put a plug in for our community of practice. Uh, this is an uh, initiative that we've partnered with Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. We meet once a month. It's just a phenomenal group, very informal. Uh, we have a number of guest speakers. This was our first session back uh, last year, I believe. Uh, and we, have, we continue to have them. Great uh, way to network with other like-minded colleagues. Uh, I always come out learning new things uh, and hearing about uh, great initiatives out there. Next slide, please. Uh, and we have a Health Canada-funded uh, SPA Alliance. So this is the other plug I'm hoping uh, we can get some of you uh, joining our alliance. Uh, our goal within this is, is not on research, it's knowledge translation. We uh, want to spread our a palliative program across the country. Uh, we have funds to help support that with different regions uh, uh, who are interested, uh, but feel free to reach out to me. Uh, there is a link on our website as well. And I think that might be it. Amazing. Well done. Well done, Sharon. I think that was a, a whistle stop tour to a, a whirlwind of resources, which is exactly what our audience was looking for. Uh, lots of questions and comments came in looking to get connected to the specific resources that you've shared. So just sort of a, a, a public service announcement that we will uh, share all the resources that were embedded in this uh, presentation through email with all of our registrants. Um, 
And uh, there was also questions around uh, access to resources in French. And I know, Sharon, you mentioned that a lot of your resources are already translated. Um, so hopefully uh, through the SPA LTC website, um, those of you looking for um, resources in French will find a lot of what you're looking for there as well. Um, we have a couple of questions and then we, we haven't got, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes here before we have to do some, some wrap up in our poll. Um, but the, one of the questions that came in, I think was related to your research with the conversation starter kit. And the question was around the role of social work or social, social service work in that research and how you may have included that. Great question. Uh, that was my oversight. Uh, I mentioned Dr. Tamara Sussman uh, at McGill. She's a social worker, uh, and she would not be happy with me right now for not highlighting that more. So, uh, you know, social work uh, and, uh, you know, engaging social workers uh, using the Conversation Starter Kit uh, is a great example. Uh, I think having uh, the social workers involved uh, for the palliative care conferences as well, uh, a couple of our studies, that's who we have uh, largely leading them. Uh, the problem is not all homes have social workers or social service workers, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, but our spa program, you know, there's no discipline uh, we, we're leaving out. Uh, we try to be very inclusive. Uh, and certainly, you know, social work uh, and, and Tamara has done some excellent work uh, leading the, the pamphlets. Uh, and the Conversation Starter Kit. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, some of her publications, uh, feel free to email me and I can share them with you. But uh, largely we're seeing the need for more compassionate care, better communication, uh, and social workers are a wonderful uh, resource to help with both of those. Thank you. And before we open our poll and uh, do our final conclusions, one last question, if you have a very quick answer is, um, there was a question around evolving end of life care and wanting to strengthen the palliative approach prior to end of life. And do you have specific resources um, for that? Yeah, so I guess uh, that's where we see advanced care planning coming into place. So the conversation starter kit is one, the pamphlets uh, as well. Uh, our dream is to have the, pam you know, the, the pamphlets that I've, I've mentioned given out at admission or at the very least at the six month post admission conference, just planting that seed. Uh, they are you know, condition specific, but then there's also uh, some general concepts around a palliative approach. Uh, and I think if we really look at family centered care and start that at the beginning uh, at admission, uh, you know, I, I think that will help solve a lot of our, our problems as well, is really being guided by what the family needs uh, and supporting them as best as we can. Thanks, Sharon. And thank you so much for being our speaker today. Thanks to all of you, our audience, for joining this webinar. Um, I'd like you to please mark your calendars. Our next webinar uh, for this webinar series will be on October 17th. And we're going to connect our webinar with Canadian Patient Safety Week, which is happening the week of October 24th. Um, and so the focus will be how safe is your care, building capacity for safety in partnership with providers, patients, and essential care partners. Um, please, if you don't mind taking a moment to jump right into the poll. Um, we just have a few questions on today's session being number one, the webinar provided useful information. Two, whether you intend to share what you learned with others. Three, if you know more about the topic than you did before. Four, if there's any topics you'd like to see covered in a future webinar, and this was the result of, you know, the answer to that question in previous ones. Um, and five, what's your gender, if, uh, where your gender refers to the gender that you internally feel and or the gender that a person publicly expresses. So quickly, those questions would really help us um, to shape our content. And again, I'd like to thank Dr. Sharon Kasselinen for your excellent presentation. Of course, thanks to you, our audience. This concludes today's event. I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay well. Take care, everyone.